So this is Eddie Glaude from Princeton University, um, uh, and I'm excited about having this conversation. Uh, and I, I too, uh, my, I'm Yosef Soret uh, here at Columbia, just a, an hour northeast of you uh, here at Columbia University, and very much looking forward to our conversation on the black church or black churches in America. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, I really enjoyed your um, uh, reading your response to uh, my admittedly provocative piece entitled <laughs> The Black Church is Dead. Um, I mean, I took myself to be doing three things. Uh, one is kind of troubling, uh, kind of received stories uh, about uh, the, the uh, black churches as necessarily prophetic or uh, necessarily progressive, wanting to say that the historiography is much more complicated than that. Right, right. Uh, uh, at least it ought to be. Um, and that there's a historical, historiographical problematic or blindness in relation to uh, the more conservative dimensions of African American religious life. Uh, the second point had to do with uh, increasing complexity of black, um, of African American life in the United States. And, mm -hmm. uh, and here I'm kind of reprising without all of the uh, bad baggage, uh, E. Franklin Frazier's mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> thesis, right? That with increasing differentiation and stratification, uh, with uh, 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 as black life modernizes, uh, uh, those structures that were so central to black life will will strain in some interesting sorts of ways under the pressure of that complexity. Yeah, you're right. And then the last point was um, really a point about uh, how uh, a kind of nostalgia, kind of longing for the past can stand in for actual work in the present. And so it's a, it's a thesis that, 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 I, that I put forward in a broader context in, in A Shade of Blue, right. but it was really about um, uh, what does it mean to always imagine the African American church in X way in relation to what it has done as opposed to what it should be doing and can do. Uh -huh. um, and how memory can constrain how we can reimagine this institution. So it was a much more prophetic call at the end, I thought. Um, and right. Obviously, I struck a nerve because uh, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> right. No, what was, was remarkable to me after reading the post and, and you know, and hearing similar rhetoric, as my, my response indicated, was mm -hmm. kind of the firestorm that it set off on a range of blogs, everything from kind of conservative uh, black evangelical blogs to uh, other academics to the kind of the dialogue even on religion dis dispatches beneath mm -hmm. right the actual responses that was uh, fascinating to see but you I think as uh, my response attempts to chart that I think uh, there are a number of ways that that we could talk about and of course mm -hmm. as you even frame our conversation I think that the first point of historiography is where I, I think most of my in energy initially went and I think perhaps the historiographic question is not is not the the the, the most helpful one for the broader audience but I, I hope that we can get to how you see the limits of the possibilities history as a problem or possibility for thinking about uh, the prophetic but what I, I guess maybe as a starting point, mm -hmm. I would like to respond to this, the, the, your, your second point in this issue of complexity and increasing diversification of the black experience in light of the uh, post-soul or post-civil civil rights moment. And right, right. I, you know, I'd love to hear you, even as I wrestled, it's funny, the, the week that I read your post, I was also talking with a number of students in my, con my current course on post-soul slash post-civil rights moment to kind mm -hmm. of explore how we think about religion in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because it would seem, on one hand, that there's two narratives charting, for those of us at least in the study of religion, right, that reads um, the decline of the black church alongside of a kind of secularization narrative, right? Both mm -hmm. of which, I think your point and uh, the broader academy have proven to, to not be the case, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so I ask, as, as, as scholars of religion, as within this values-added dialogue, how do we chart post-black church, post-religion, in relationship to post-soul, post-civil rights, post-colonial, po all these, all these posts, right, that kind of presume right. a kind of, uh, seculariz secularization narrative, right? So the, yeah, and you know, and secular, secularization narratives are, are complicated, right? I mean, they mm -hmm. can register a number of different things, right? They can register 
uh, claims about the privatization of, 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 of religion. They can register uh, claims about uh, the disappearance of religion. They could register right. claims about uh, a plurality of religious uh, beliefs in the public domain, which necessitate the emergence of different kinds of languages to talk across these sectarian divides. Right. So secularization, in and of itself, kind of as a term, as a shorthand, muddles the waters in some way. Exactly. I think exactly. both of them, though, I think narratives of decline and and secularization theses um, are attempts to register a shift in context, mm-hmm. uh, an eclipse, as it were, of uh, particular conditions within which uh, uh, a specific institution uh, existed or took shape. So what it's like for uh, African-American religious expression in the context of slavery as an invisible institution is very different uh, what it will look like in the context of, say, post-emancipation uh, Amer- America, right? What CME looks like in the context of, of uh, pre-20th uh, century uh uh, post, I mean, pre-civil rights movement is very different than what CME looks like today. Right. And so how do you chart those changes? Uh, how do you register them? And how might those changes impact and affect uh, the form and content of religious expression? And so part of what I think, you know, when you come down, as Bill Hart rightly said, as the mad madman with the gay <laughs> science, right? Right. Uh, proclaiming that God is dead. Usually what those sorts of hyperbolic moments are all about is trying to get folk to register that the dom- that the terrain has shifted. Right. And so what it means to be black, uh, a, a black, what it means to be black and Christian under different conditions requires some kind of reflection. How do we mark it? Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so in other words, what I'm trying to say is, is that uh, I mean, it's not so much a narrative of decline or secularization. It's what those words register, mm-hmm. uh, and they register shifts, changes, um, uh, fundamental um, developments that uh, render certain ways of thinking incoherent or less effective, or the like. So. Does no, that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And I, but I think what, like, one of the other things that you point to in that question of diversification is that often commentators on black experience in the post-civil rights moment have not spent a, a great deal of time trying to chart how religion figures in because it was by, by virtue perhaps of their uh, location not in direct connection to black churches or black religious communities more broadly for various sorts of reasons it would seem that Relig- most commentators or efforts to theorize the post-black or the, the post-soul don't foreground questions of religion, right? Which would give the kind of, uh, which would seem to expose a kind of assumption that religion is not as central to post-civil rights formations, right? Well, I mean, it either poses that or that it presupposes a very static conception of what black religion is. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes So sense. it's not changing, right? It's always already the same, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, even when Du Bois and, and Souls, right, t- mm-hmm. decides to take up the black church in, of the faith of our fathers, right? Right. He's thinking about it as the site, the principal site for the exercise of black public reason. So if we're going to understand the shifts in black public culture, according to Du Bois, if we're going to understand why Booker T. Washington's strategy is wrong, right? Mm-hmm. We need to understand how the conditions of black America have changed. Right. So much so that they've affected the most important institution in black life. Right, and if that institution is undergoing substantive and significant change, right, mm-hmm. then the exercise of black public reason is <laughs> should be uh, fundamentally affected. So this is this is a really this is a really profound point. I think. I mean, not to say that I'm making a profound point, but it's mm-hmm. just a profound gesture in my view. Right. Well, and I think it's this, and it's the way that religion is not perceived as central to the way in which black reasoning in publics takes place, right? Mm. And that is where I think your essay challenges, right, American publics to reimagine, right? Mm -hmm. So what that is to say, what does this kind of post-black church narrative uh, and the call for the prophetic have to say of the rise of Jakes, right? Or Mm -hmm. the, you know, the work, so... It's not so much that we're claiming that there's a new black church and we, you know, think of the work that uh, some of our colleagues have done, Shane Lee's effort to, you know, chart that territory and see what has shifted and in, in, in how Gates invite, uh, how Jake's invites an invitation to that. But it's also, I think, a question of like what 
is dominant, right? Because there were Jake's figures before, right? There oh, is J.M. Gates. There's those figures before, but it's what's kind of dominating the discourse about what it means to be black and religious or black and cre- Christian, right? So, yeah, absolutely. And part of what blocks the way to a kind of substantive engagement with that question is not only uh, uh, the, uh, shall we say, the, the, the silences vis-a-vis the important role of black churches or black religious commitments or black Christian commitments more specifically mm-hmm. in African American public life, uh, a kind of secular prejudice, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also a kind of standing assumption about um, uh, uh, African American Christian commitments being necessarily progressive and prophetic. Yes, yes, yes. So the very fact that uh, African Americans in large numbers can come out against Proposition 8 uh, uh, I'll come out for, I can't, I get them mixed up, uh, <laughs> um, can come out against same-sex marriage. How about right. that? Right, that works, yeah. Uh, can uh, uh, sound uh, very conservative notes about abortion, uh, can uh, put forward a kind of theological uh, set of claims that are more consonant with ORU, or Roberts <laughs> University, right. than with King and BU. Right. Um, these sorts I appreciate so, you referencing my two, I my, my I undergraduate and my master's degree. I had to give you a shout out. To <laughs> I you. appreciate part, it. Part of, part of this has to do with really understanding the very fertile ground uh, within which notions of what it means to be Christian are contested within black communities. Right. right. And I just don't think we've done... Uh, that kind of work, and it seems to me all the more important in this particular moment uh, that progressive voices within religious communities stand up and proclaim, mm-hmm. right, uh, their Christian identity in this instance, right, or their Muslim identity in another instance, mm-hmm. right, but to claim these identities as central, even as they're offering uh, a vision of the world that runs contrary to those who are much who are much more to the right. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, yeah, no, I do, I do, and I think, right, and, and what, what, what I was getting at is what, the way in which I appreciate your use both here and in, in the, in your, in your most recent work, the language of the post soul, mm-hmm. right, because it's something that, uh, I think within our field, we've been late to the, within the kind of, those who study religion, we've been late to engaging that discourse, right? So as I allude to in my response, kind of those conversations with uh, Stuart Hall and Cornell West and Bell Hooks around you know, kind of bringing postmodern discourse to bear on the black experience, right? To say that we can't speak of whether it be black churches or, uh, or any aspect of the black experience in singularity, right? Mm-hmm. So oh, how do we draw on that to rethink the African-American religious experience, which I think is where, where our field is. But what I think it, what, what is, uh, I think, often kind of is at the center of the resistance to engage that, whether it's by black church representatives or uh, within the study of religion, is the it has to do with the relationship to the market, mm-hmm. right? So when, when Nelson George is, is attempting to think through uh, post soul, it's about this unprecedented access to the market that creates complexity and diversification within black communities, right? That... Mm-hmm. Big divide, that increasing divide between the elites and the, right, uh, the elites and the folks in what Bill Wilson refers to as the underclass, right, that you point to with the debate around healthcare, right, what's at mm-hmm. stake there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, and, and uh, the resistance, right, that comes up in debates around President Obama's election and his presidency is that we can no longer presume to account for all of the black experience as inherently oppositional to American identity. Right, Absolutely. which is where I hear you pushing us, right? And Absolutely. so this, and then, then when you mix that together with academic, often kind of academic identities, uh, insisting on opposition to the market, which may be real or imagined in the same way uh, that your narrative accounts, you know. So I'm, 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 I'd be interested to, 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 to. I don't, I don't think that was the central piece of your argument, but I could hear, you know, how do we think about the way in which the market experience, even dating back to the 1920s, reimagines, causes us to think differently about what is dominant in uh, the black religious experience, right? So I the mean, folks, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go I'm ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so 
right? In addition to the academic responses to your piece, you have a group of, if you will, the talented tenth of black religious leadership who respond <laughs> viscerally because no longer is the, uh, in the same degree, uh, our cues being taken from the black Protestant establishment, mm -hmm. right? But dom kind of the, where the trends are, are the kind of prominent directions within black religious communities are often mediated through the market, right? right. Me or these new media forms. Right, and, and, and the most successful of, of, of uh, contemporary expressions of black Christianity are those who are, shall we say, uh, skillful. Yes. At no, deploying uh, market sensibilities in order to, um, shall we say, uh, grow their market share. Yeah. Um, How yeah. dare you? We're talking about religion. <laughs> but this is this is simple. I mean, you know, some people, you know, and, and some people use this as a kind of negative, yep. as a, as a way of bringing a kind of negative critique to bear on on these particular uh, expressions of, of Black Christianity. But I just think it's 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 really it's much more complicated than that. This somehow isn't Black Church. That somehow this has compromised uh, the true the true meaning of the gospel. What it means to witness witness Christ as sacrifice and the like. Yep. I think what, what is required is, again, trying to map and chart the different contexts within which Christian, and particularly black Christian witness, right, um, witnesses are made. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we do see here in an increasingly, uh, in a world where reification and commodification goes all the way down, right, right there is a sense in which the product of one's faith Right. right, the packaging, its 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 marketing is as crucial uh, as the content of that faith. Mm -hmm. And we saw this happening when we when people were consuming um, recorded rec recorded sermons right. in the, in the in the early night in the early twentieth century. We saw this when people uh, were listening to gospel records. We saw right. this uh, when we saw kind of mass consumer culture touch. Uh, African American religious life, it affected its form and content. Right. right. Um, and and so it's it's a matter of telling that story. And we've seen Jonathan Walton do this. We've seen some other of our colleagues write about this, this kind of interesting nexus of of black religious commitments or Christian commitments, more specifically, right. market developments. Right. And in interesting sorts of ways, a very diverse theological uh, ground within which those form the two former interact and inter intersect. Uh -huh. Now, all of this is a bit abstract. I mean, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is this. Black Christians are as complicated as any other Christians in the world. Exactly. Right. Right. And sometimes the way we tell our story about these black Christians is as if uh, their witness is pretty straightforward. Right. And that's not the case at all. Right. It's an exceptionalist account and it's oppositional to how Americans tell their Christian story. Right? Absolutely. And what I want to believe, what I want to insist uh -huh is that when we begin to fall prey to that, right, it arrests uh, uh, the power of, on, of ongoing revelation. It, 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 in some significant way, this is taking it outside of the realm mm. of, of the academic study. Right? Yep. It, it, it's really about what does it mean uh, to believe that God can speak to you, yeah. that you can actually experience revelation anew. And that can be the source of prophetic energies uh, under different conditions. But if it's the case that all is settled, whether it's whether it's a kind of literalism vis-a-vis -vis the Bible or whether it's a kind of a standard story about the progressive nature of black churches, uh, in some ways what happens is that it arrests uh, the religious imagination. It, 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 it uh, shall we say, freezes mm -hmm. um, uh, what we're capable of doing, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, and that, well, and that right, that gets at one one of my other questions is in mm. what ways is this right? Not just a conversation about how black experiences change, but what is, if you will, kind of the religious or the Christian component, right? You bring in the language of revelation, mm -hmm. um, and how do we? And that invites kind of categories, right, that are shared within. Christian communities in particular across right. racial lines, right? Right. So right, on one absolutely. hand, how do we, right, to borrow from Albert Murray, recognize that black people are omni-Americans, 
um, but then also kind of account for kind of racial difference that is still very real in a post-civil rights moment, right, that kind of charts our work to take account of the least of these, a Christian category, but then also stay open to the fact that, you know, that revelation is ongoing, something that Christians, black and white, continue to wrestle with, right? Which right. is kind of ironic, right, because that invites a discourse, a conversation about the spirit, right, celebrated most prominently within these kind of neo-Pentecostal churches that are also often or have been some of the first most willing to engage those new technologies that we were talking right, about, right? right? right. So whether is, you're AME or what have you, it's those impulses that seem to be governing or dominating uh, the, mo the fastest growing black churches. No, I mean, this is absolutely right. This is why your response to the piece was so brilliant and so prescient. I mean, um, I mean, you, you saw what was really at stake. What does it mean to be black and Christian? Right, right. right. And I think that kind of these, these, shall we say, easy ways of rendering what black identity involves, entails, how we might think about black solidarity, all of that has been complicated. This is the stuff that you were talking about, really bringing into uh, African-American religious studies uh, right. resources coming from cultural studies that allow us to complicate the category that overdetermines the noun in this instance, right? Mm -hmm. So we can think about blackness in a much more sophisticated, much more subtle, much more nuanced way, even as we register certain cultural continuities, even as we register certain kinds of cultural distinctiveness. We want to say that there's some differences here that matter, that matter in the form and content of how these folks express who they are and who they desire to be. The same thing hold, holds true for, for, for the Christian side, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christian as a category is highly contested. People yeah. debate what it means to be Christian. Right. And black folk are participating in that conversation uh, in ways that is that that are as complicated as other Christians around the world. Right. So how they're thinking about what it means to witness Christ, how they're thinking about what it means to exist within a particular kind of ecclesial formation, right? right. Or expression of that witness. How they're thinking about their relation to, 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 the, to the gospel. How they're thinking about their relation to fellow Christians and non-Christians. All of this matters, right? right? And so part of what I'm trying to do is to insist that Christians argue among themselves about what it means to be Christian. Mm -hmm. And insist that progressive voices within Christian communities uh, do so. Now, some people have written, which was really funny in the blogosphere, somebody said, well, this is ironic because Glaude ain't nothing but a pragmatic naturalist. Right, right, right. How right. is he going to make this claim? But you saw in my response to, to, to the readings, or to, to the essays, that uh, I'm bearing witness to my own recent conversion. Right. Understanding how powerful uh, Christian stories are to my own sense of self. Right. Uh, bearing witness to my own uh, uh, struggle with uh, and commitment to, right, acknowledging God's presence in my own life. Right. Uh, and in some ways, it's the kind of vehemence of the young in the faith uh, that comes through in the <laughs> Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm even seeing, okay, I'm seeing that even more fully now to hear you put it. Okay. But, you know, that's coming through the piece, right? And right. So there's a sense in which, okay, if I'm going to do this, Right. I mean, in some ways, it's like Emerson's uh, Harvard Divinity School address. Right. Emerson mm. was trying to say something powerful to these preachers. Right. Right. About how they will preach the gospel. Right. And whether or not their words will generate conformity. Right. Or whether they will unleash uh, the godly energies that can be found in all of us. Right. And, 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 and so, you know, I didn't do it too well, but I was trying to rewrite that piece in the context of, 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 of black America. Because I'm, of course, not the last one. And I mean, not the first, nor will I be the last to declare the death of the black church. Right. But I hope that my tongue was squarely in my cheek when I said it. <laughs> well, that was self-evident to me that you were <laughs> meaning to provoke some folk, and obviously, perhaps you accomplished what you set out to do effectively, <laughs> given that we're here having this discourse in the storm of blogs that have been put out in the in between. Right. Um, but I, I guess the question, and maybe this gets to you know our, our thinking or what we hope to talk about, and what is the substance of the prophetic, or what, mm -hmm. and charting what it means to what become the norms of the grounds for the progressive, because clearly, 
uh, we could see in the effort to delegitimize your 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 own coming to the faith, if you will, by questioning you or labeling you a pragmatic naturalist as as, as an act of bad faith, right? If for someone to do that is is unfair and doesn't have any place in the discourse. But I think um, what it represents or reveals is a certain reluctance or hesitance to kind of put competing visions of Christianity on display. Oh, right. Absolutely. If a certain vision of Christianity, right, particularly over the last 40 years, right, to say Christian means one thing and how we align ourselves with that vision of Christianity in a kind of public sphere of sound bites, as you mentioned in your response, uh, to counter that causes questions. Mm -hmm. And I think, right, so that discourse has been dominated by, if you will, uh, the kind of the religious right, right, with kind of short, simple answers to these religious questions that often, uh, lean in a particular way that do not support or create space and possibilities and resources for the least of these. But yet the question becomes then how does uh, a kind of, whether it's religious liberal or a Christian progressive that doesn't want to hold fast to kind of rigid notions of orthodoxy, how does that how does that type of perspective weigh in engaging novel forms of technology as you, are you, as you will, and, and put forward a vision, right, that mm -hmm. um, doesn't end up just seeming like a reaction to the dominance of the religious right. Right. I mean, I think it, you know, we have to understand, mm -hmm. I think, uh, the power of these various medium, media mm -hmm. uh, for engaging in the kind of work uh, on behalf of those who suffer most and in light of the advances that enable us to do that work uh, uh, in an even more expansive and, and, and powerful way. I mean, you can look at it. What happened to the nature of Christianity, brother, when uh, the printing press came on the scene? Right, right. <laughs> oh, right? Oh, yep, yep. Yeah. I mean, there's a fundamental democratization of the faith. Mm-hmm. In an interesting yeah. sorts of ways. I'm following you, yeah. Yep. Right. So what happens when you have these technological developments that enable me to pull up uh, scripture on my on my PDA? Mm -hmm. right? So you can I got a new droid and I can look in, and there I could read the Psalms every morning. Right. Right. What does that mean? Right. And so how does that find its way in the very in the form of worship? Um in the ways in which we navigate space and time. And we can't be Luddites in this regard. Uh, we have to understand that these are avenues uh, and sites, right, to engage in the kind of work and to engage in the kind of contesting work mm -hmm. uh, that is required, right? Mm -hmm. So part of, part of, you know, writing it in a blog, uh -huh. right, um, um, us having this conversation, on a webcam, right? Using you know, using Skype, mm -hmm. right? Is is precisely the ways in which these new technological forms, right, become vehicles for expression of the faith and conduits uh, to spark the imagination in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems to me that what it means to proselytize, what it means to preach, what it means to convert, what it means uh, to witness and love and service. Right is has fundamentally changed, brother. So, I mean, just fundamentally. And unless we understand that, uh, we're gonna be looking at the back of people's heads. Right. Right. And right. having churches that are full, you know, of our friends. Right. As yeah. opposed to out here really doing the work that we've been called that we've been called to do. I hope we can. Uh, well, and I think. Mm -hmm. I guess my at simultaneously I'm thinking in two different directions, right? Okay. For, for, and perhaps there's not empirical evidence to suggest this uh, that this observation is accurate, but it seems to me that even in this moment, and this comes out of my own experience and kind of thinking critically about the uh, God, the the genre, the troubling genre, um, mm -hmm. simply because its aesthetics are not uh, always up to par with the mainstream but that of, of gospel music right, right, right. <laughs> and 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 mm -hmm. now it's contemporary um extension of gospel or holy hip-hop mm -hmm. right and so here you would have a group of uh preachers often lay people as well who see themselves as called to take advantage 
of this new novel musical form, right? The voice of the hip hop generation as a way mm-hmm. of keeping the church real, right? So they're embracing this form. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I think it's often the case, and maybe this is a question of who distributes or who produces, so not just the artists, but it seems that often the folks most willing, right? And so which makes the value of a blog like this the, and, and the kind of growing voice of religious progressives that those folk quick to um, quick to employ novel media to put their religious voice often are kind of liberal about employing novel technologies but conservative around... Um, their theology or social mm-hmm. issues, right? Mm-hmm. So the kind of the rallying around uh, uh, Proposition 8 in California, right? The, the right is able to make traction because it quickly deploys these forms and, you know, r- rallies a base. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I, I think, right, that's a, the, how do we square that with, right, even in early Pentecostal history of a willingness for kind of to be right. socially conservative but progressive in matters of technology, um, and I guess I guess you're right to point to a dialogue like this that can say, you know, we can be Christian and support equality across the board for uh, same gender loving couples. That we can ins- insist that public health, uh, you know, the option, and we think about the vote last night, and at least the mm-hmm. movement for it, uh, mm-hmm. the passage towards the Senate. That these issues are very much a part. You can be Christian and hold to a progressive political perspective, and can make the argument. And can make the make the argument on Christian grounds, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and Christians have made the argument for same sex uh, uh, love. Can mm-hmm. have made the argument for uh, being engaged with the world on these sorts of questions, right? I mean, uh, so you're absolutely right. But you know, you think about Billy Sunday, you think about um, those old Bible colleges, you think about uh, the kind of cottage industry that was developed under, in the underground, as it were. Uh, at the time when liberal Protestantism had a uh, reign supreme, um, and and the kind of work, innovative work around radio, innovative work around uh, mass mailing, innovative right. work around just simply popular forms. I mean, here you have uh, a group of folk who are, uh, shall we say, locked out of the public domain in terms right. of the public conversation right. of what Christianity is, generating all sorts of uh, of innovations under the radar, uh, designed to uh, uh, burst forward in interesting sorts of ways, uh, uh, or will, bur- uh, will eventually burst forward mm-hmm. uh, in interesting sorts of ways to impact the form and content of, of Christian expression in the United States. So here you are, here we are in a moment where the hegemon is is a kind of conservative witness, um, and progressives. Uh, progressive Christians have to understand the lesson. Right. Right. Um, right. You know, the noise, the chatter of, 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 of the mainstream uh, around what it means to witness one's faith uh, inclines one in a certain ideological direction. How then do we create the mechanisms, right, uh, to, to revitalize, say, union, to revitalize theological education, mm-hmm. to... Mm-hmm. to 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 uh, tell a different kind of story within our religious studies programs, to uh, have outreach to uh, to to ministries uh, or churches, so that we can begin uh, to to have an impact. In some places, the National Black Church Initiative, and other places, they're doing this sort of work, and it's under the radar screen. Right. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, this is this is what has to happen. This is what happens in the natural. I guess I don't want to say it's inevitable, but these cycles in which, uh, you know, people, you know, views wane and they wax and, you know, these sorts of things. So, mm. as, as it were. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm of the mind, man, that, uh, uh, we're in a moment where, um, uh, uh we're running vision deficits. Okay. Uh, where, uh, our imaginations have been captured. And it's mm. it's increasingly dangerous uh, because the moment requires vision and imagination. And because we're so settled into our habits of living, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a challenge for us uh, to step up uh, and, and, and profess anew 
Um, it really is. Instead, what we do is we engage in lamentation. We mm -hmm. uh, we have a nostalgic longing. We, oh, I wish we had a king. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, the prophetic Baptist convention was, progressive Baptist convention was X. Right. right? Wasn't it wonderful back da? Right. And, and right. part of the challenge is, uh, you know, to, uh, to step forward. You know, and and it's going to be not only just simply in terms of the innovations that that are taking place in the music, right? Right. Uh, that it's really complicated, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's going to have to take place in terms of how we imagine church. Well, see, so this is what I heard you saying too, because part of I guess what we're talking about also is clearly right. We think about postal and we think about the increased class divide, but part of what I also hear you saying is about uh, centering in the relationship between clergy and lay, right? Mm -hmm. So if we think of the decline of liberal Protestantism and the fact that what some, I was part of a group maybe eight or nine years ago as I was finishing up at Boston University where statistics were suggesting that some of 70% of mainline Protestant churches would be without someone to fulfill the fill the pulpit within the next few years, right? That all these mm -hmm. clergy would be retiring. Now, granted, I don't think in African-American congregations there's quite the same issue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that's... But we can, say, you know, chart the shift from mainline Protestants to these non-denominational churches and what have you that you mm -hmm. mentioned and that I also mentioned in my response. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also about, right, beyond moving beyond the provocation and maybe uh, this this question of what becomes the the substance of the prophetic or the progressive, is it a call then that for a, to, to borrow the New Testament language of a priesthood of all believers then, that pastors are then out of a job, or a, God forbid, but then how do we be, you know, how do we reimagine church, uh, uh, then ought there be black churches that are taking cues from the emergent churches that attempt to be uh, deliberately uh, if you will, anti-clerical or at least anti-hierarchical in a traditional mm -hmm. sense? Or is it about simply, you know, make the provocation and then individual believers ought to engage? And, um, you know, what what becomes then the ground, right? This is, I guess, in right. where the right. post-church and post-black conversation uh, comes together, and that is where, become, where are the grounds for solidarity, recognizing the complexity uh, the stratifications that uh, separate us all, yet we still find ourselves wanting to be part of community, wanting to claim mm -hmm. uh, the name Christian um, and black uh, or what have you. Yeah, I mean that's it's really complicated, and we're going to have to think about that over the course of <laughs> over the course of several several more years of our careers, right? Right, right, uh, right, um, and, right. But it seems to me it's going to be both, and it's not going to be either or, and it's going to be some more than that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, we have to engage in the kind of experimentalism uh, that the moment requires, right? Right. Uh, there. I mean, I'm of the mindset I want a kingdom of priests. Right. I want uh, people to be in the pews who are uh, actively engaging mm. uh, their faith. Right. Uh, and not falling for a cult of personality or not. Right. Um, shall we say, relinquishing their responsibility. I mean, there's this wonderful line in Emerson where he says, dare to love God without mediator or veil. Right, um, right, right. And right. It's a, that's a profound claim and with serious theological implications. But but the point is, how, does, how do we understand our relationship to God's grace and love, and how does that manifest itself in our relationship to others in relation to the world? Right. Um, and to that extent, uh, the, the, what the form and content of black church life will look like, I'm not sure. But I'm, I want us to tinker. Right. right? I want. I want to hear. I wish we had some more Thurmans on the planet. Right. Right. Who right. are kind of thinking carefully about their faith and trying to enact it in the very ways in which uh, we worship. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and that's kind of an ironic move, right? To say what I want is to harken back to the past, but that shows you that it's not just simply a kind of iconic, you know, an iconoclastic view. It's not just simply hating on the past, right? It's right. about looking to those moments of innovation, those imaginative leaps, right? Right, as examples, as exemplars of what is required of us in our own moment. Right. Uh, and so, what will be the ground? I'm not sure. I, what I would like for us to do is to test. To raise those difficult questions and to point to models that have, uh -huh. in the past, that have simultaneously proclaimed the gospel but 
put on the ground, raised or pointed or foregrounded the fact that it's always up for grabs and contested. So I, 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 I think that, I guess, and perhaps recognizing our limitations, right, as oh, ones primarily grounded in the academy but committed to progressive uh, engagement, uh, but simply to raise the question and foreground the fact that what it means to be Christian uh, in a universal church, what it means to be Christian and black in a so-called post-racial moment, that uh, those things have to be interrogated and not just assume uniformity. And that, that's at the end of the day. And I think if we do that, if we do that, I am convinced, uh, you know, people were so upset that I used, said that the black church was dead. Right. And I said it was dead because I wanted to play on the resurrection. <laughs> right. I, mean, I got you. I, without salvation is not possible without, uh, without Jesus' death. Right. Which, and so it's... It seems to me, and here we are getting close to Easter Sunday. Yeah. Right. And and it's the irony of Easter Sunday is that it's on the same day that we mark the anniversary of King's murder. Hmm. I didn't realize they land together today, huh? Yeah. This year. Hmm. In this liturgical calendar. Wow. I mean, part of what I say at the end of the piece is that black churches will rise again. Right. And that we will find it within ourselves. Right. Right. Uh, we're... To, to prophesy anew, where they will say, we must be drunk. Right. Right. <laughs> With that new wine. So right. part of part of the work of, of a kind of experimentally driven faith, right, right, is that on those occasions where it requires of us to run ahead of the evidence, our imaginations are crucial. Right. They're not necessarily utopian, but they're crucial uh, to guiding our feet. Right. And, and, Right now, whether it's in Christian community, black Christian communities, whether it's in African American politics broadly, we are experiencing a nadir with regards to the imagination. Right. No, and I, I think in that simple message that you know how the story of the of salvation is told by jumping from you know Good Friday to Easter Sunday, <laughs> um, I well, think right you that foreground that theological issue very well. But I and I, and hopefully I think uh, and perhaps for a future conversation in that in that vision recognizing uh, our, our good colleague Anthea's contribution is that black Christians as they uh, continue to recognize their place of privilege in the in the, the history of the West will be more willing to meet our brothers and sisters who do not claim Christ right recognize oh, not labeling them simply as unbelievers in Obama's gesture to uh, you know, kind of expand the table, but recognizing uh, the human community of uh, all faith persuasions and what have you. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think it's uh, if we keep if we keep uh, fighting the good fight, uh, there's a Christian voice, uh, there are Christian voices uh, to make that argument, and I and and I and my heart will only smile as we continue as we continue to as I continue to grow in the faith. And and hear those arguments made from around around the country. So Indeed. I've learned a lot. Trust me, brother. <laughs> well, it, this has been a, uh, a a wonderful dialogue with you yeah, as absolutely. we as we both continue to uh, you know work out what it means to be uh, black and Christian as people of faith. Um, and I'm glad for the invitation to uh, have had the conversation. Same here, and I appreciate it, man. The dialogue is wonderful. You take care of yourself. All right, Eddie. Be well. Take care.